Uh, we're gathered together here at the Keter Center at the College of the Ozarks uh, today, which is Monday, July 10th of 2017. And uh, my name is Tom Peters. I'm the Dean of Libraries at Missouri State University. And we've gathered together a, a group of uh, women who were uh, very much involved uh, the, in founding and developing uh, women's athletics at Southwest Missouri State University, now known as Missouri State University. I would suggest, why don't we uh, go around and introduce ourselves, just for the future listening audience and viewing audience, and then we can just talk about huh? women's athletics. Do you, do you want to go? Oh, yeah. I'm Reba Sims, and I came to Missouri State, then SMS, in 1969, and I coached for 10 years, but I offici officiated continually through that time and into the early 2000s, and I retired from teaching and um, supervising student teachers and I think 2011. My name is Linda Dollar. I uh, started as a student at Southwest Missouri State in 1966, graduated in 70, went away to graduate school and then came back in 71 as assistant volleyball coach to Dr. Wynn for one year and then remained as the volleyball coach until 1995 and then retired in 2002. I was a full-time teacher and coach when I first started out. Tell them what sports you played. Yeah, play what sports? I played uh, <laughs> four years of volleyball, four years of basketball, four years of softball, one year of field hockey, one year of tennis, one year of golf. And I want to back up. <laughs> when I came to Missouri State, I coached uh, field hockey, basketball, softball, only coach, no trainers to yeah. deal with any injuries or anything, but I had trainers on the men's side that helped me out a whole lot and showed me how to tape people up <laughs> for what their injury was. Cheryl Burnett came to Southwest Missouri State in uh, 1984 as an assistant coach under Valerie Goodwin. Dr. Wynn uh, hired me um, in 1987 to be a women's basketball coach until 2001. I'm uh, Mary Jo Wynn, and uh, I was a student at SMS for four years. Uh, left to uh, <coughs> uh, get my master's degree came back to uh, SMS in 1957 and uh, have remained there until I retired in uh, uh, July of 1998. I'm Nancy Hodson and I graduated from Southwest Missouri State <coughs> in 1962. I uh, coached at the high school level, but while I was at the university there were no women's sports. My name is Marilyn Moore, and I was at Missouri State, uh, known as Southwest Missouri State, in 1958 to 1962. Uh, they had sports days, and I participated in volleyball, basketball, softball, field hockey, swim team, track, and Dr. Wynn. Mary Jo Wynn was a coach of most of those and an inspiration to all of us. <laughs> and I continued on to officiate volleyball and basketball after I started teaching at Hillcrest High School for 30 years. Coached volleyball and basketball there and tried to share what I had learned at Southwest Missouri State by having sports days first. And then finally they agreed that we could have girls sports in 1973. 1973. All right, well, thanks everyone. Thanks for getting together. And uh, so we've been chatting before I officially started the recording here. But um, one thing that I'm really interested in is uh, the whole thing. But um, somebody mentioned that it started off, it was just part of physical education department. So how did it get, you know, how did it get to where it is today? Can someone kind of explain how it went from? Yeah. <clears throat> well, 
Well, um, Go ahead. I, I went on a meeting, a physical education meeting, uh, with one of our uh, administrators. Uh, I think his name passed away. He was the uh, assistant to the president. Uh, what was his name? You'll think of it in a minute. Yeah, it'll come to me. <laughs> but anyway, we were uh, going to this meeting, and uh, Aldo Sieben uh, was the director of the men's program at the time. And uh, so he asked me on the way to this meeting if I would be interested in becoming the director of the women's athletics that Aldo Sieben had suggested that he talk with me. And I told him I would be delighted. That was something that I had a lot of interest in. And so when we came back, that became a reality. And I became the director of the Women's Athletic Program. And what year was that? Um, I think it's 1976. Is Wasn't it? I had, a, I had a picture of it. Uh, and the picture notes at 76. The article does not. It's out of the yearbook. I'm going to say it was before that because of Title IX. Well, Wayne, Wayne McKinney, who was the head of the physical education department, uh -huh. kind of ran, allowed, supported uh, women's athletics before they would identify uh, athletic director for women, and mm -hmm. he just kind of so he gave was a, us he money was a strong to travel. Early supporter. I had my notes. That was about 1964. That he yes, uh, that's before me. <coughs> yeah. He was there when I came in '69. And he's the one that took <coughs> money from the physical education department and uh, gave us like $300 for volleyball or right. whatever. Right. Uh, it, was just, it was enough to buy gas. We drove everywhere. <laughs> we hardly ever stayed overnight. No, no. and uh, athletes uh, fed themselves. We didn't feed them. Really? So we went to a lot of McDonald's. Either. <laughs> and yep. uh, so he, he was a, a wonderful support person. He felt his philosophy was that Every physical education major should have some experience in athletics. Right. Male and female. Mm -hmm. That is true. Did the women, female majors, did they respond positively? I mean, did you, did you ever have a trouble <coughs> fielding a team? Or? Um, no, a lot of times we would get <coughs> students out of physical education classes to make the team. Because, uh -huh. you know, we were recruiting. We didn't have any funds to recruit. Yeah. And so we just used the female women interested in sports to uh, field And teams. if they're in physical education, they're interested in sports. And they love to play. Yeah. Right. So yeah. wasn't get that it true also that the reputation of the physical education department, in due large part to Dr. Mary Jo Wynn, had a lot of students come to Missouri State Thus, you already had a very talented pool because of educators, and you were one of those, well, I would assume. Well, back then, I think, most of your team was composed of physical education majors. Mm -hmm. It was the exception that you would have somebody that was not uh -huh. in physical education. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you look at it today, there's hardly one yeah. person on any of the teams that is a physical education major. Yeah. Um, so the strength of the department. Right, the strength of the department, that's how people were asking how I got these good volleyball players, and it was because we had such a good physical education program at the university. So how did you recruit? Did you just observe <coughs> and then approach? Individual? We held a tryout and put a sign up uh -huh. that said tryout. <laughs> if so you're interested, <laughs> come try out. Come on, I mean, we didn't places. travel. I didn't recruit uh -huh. at the very beginning yeah. because, I mean, I didn't have anything to offer them. But you sort of recruited right on campus. I mean, you were just... They just showed up. Just I mean, basically because of reputation of what was happening. Our school was very progressive in allowing, like for volleyball, that we were allowed to practice, or I mean travel. Mm -hmm. We were in an AAU Oklahoma League. That's who we played. We didn't play other colleges. 
until we went to the state championship because we had to play them. <laughs> and you went, volleyball went to the first national championship yeah, that the women's program went to. Yeah. Right. Well, the excitement over volleyball at the university carried over into the high schools, the local high schools, because mm -hmm. when I had tryouts for volleyball in 1973, this is just starting, but this is their first opportunity to play, mm -hmm. put an announcement on the PA, you know, if you're interested in trying out the volleyball team, show up. 105 girls. I had 105 girls in that little jam. <laughs> so the interest was as a result of Linda Dollar and, and Mary Jo and the different ones that had promoted volleyball. Yeah. And can we go all the way back, Dr. Wynn, to tell the story of the volleyball story all the way back to Oklahoma now that Linda brought that up? Uh, you went to watch <laughs> AAU, and please use names and let's help her get all the names. Yes, please. Uh, well, first of all, uh, you know, most of us females as coaches didn't have any training or background to coach. <laughs> and so I used to drive to Tulsa, Oklahoma. Well, first of all, though, let me say that uh, when we went to the AAU tournaments, we were the only college team there. And so Mary Jo Pepler, who is a professional volleyball player, and I don't know where she is now. At the time. Yeah, at she the was time. Like 19 years old and was one of the best players in the world. Yes, yeah. And she took a liking to our team because I guess we were college and she started helping me a little bit. Uh -huh. And she even came to the university a few times and uh, even worked with the team right. on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, Frida uh, Cooper, Cooper. Uh, played on her team and came with her. And Frida was from Tulsa, she and her husband Jess, and he worked with the Y in Tulsa. And so getting to know them, then I used to drive down to Tulsa and have Frida and Jess teach me. And then I would come back and try to relay that to the team. So you were getting coaching lessons, yes. basically. Yes. And yes. that was only when you were teaching, right? I mean, yes. you were doing that all volunteer. Yes. No payment. Mm -hmm. Not for not for coaching. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Just to get that At clear that time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so anyway, we became the first team. Teams, uh, you know, trying to think, well, how did you learn the overhead volleyball serve? You know, Mary Ellen Cloninger, uh, who started coaching and teaching overhead volleyball serve, uh, had a lot of questions as to how she learned the overhead volleyball She was serve. one of your players. Yes, she was one of the players. And what year was this that the overhand serve came in? Oh, gosh. I, I, did you do that, Linda? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, so yeah. Oh, yeah, it's Dr. Wynn taught her, right? <laughs> well, I mean, I did it in high school, oh, okay. but it was, it was yeah, right about that time. Well, my kids already were serving overhand. Mm -hmm. See, 1964 was when volleyball went into the Olympics. Right. Oh, yeah. So then that popularity yeah. increased. Yeah. So when you said Mary Jo Pepler was a professional, you meant an Olympian. <laughs> Olympic level because there weren't oh, yes. professional volleyball at that point, was there? Um, there might have been. I'm not sure. Oh, okay. But she she was on the national team. Yes. And played in the uh, what was then U USVPA, the the club league nationals, and she would come when I was coaching. She came and did a couple clinics, worked with our team, and all we had to do was pay gas money. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't pay them anything. Yeah, <laughs> when they came. Yeah, I mean, she it's was very good. gracious. Yes, and was. We just got a major jump on all the other universities in terms of volleyball because of this uh, initial Oklahoma League that we were in that, that where men were playing as well. And we're like, really? Men play volleyball? <laughs> and, you know, it was, it was fun. It was exciting. It was all new. And our kids just really got the jump. And then the word spread, and then we got more and more people to come in yeah. and 
try out and play. Because we used to have three, we had three volleyball teams. And uh, I coached all three teams with no assistant coach or anything. <laughs> and you weren't being paid to be the coach? Ever? Not initially. And why did you have three <laughs> volleyball teams? Well, because of Wayne McKinney's philosophy, really, of everybody needs to be a part of athletics okay. in some way. And we had a varsity team, a junior varsity team, yeah. and then we had a B team. And our so if 105 women showed up with a call mm -hmm. for volleyball, mm -hmm. all 105 women would place at some level. Well, varsity, junior mm -hmm. varsity, B team. No, I mean, we did have cuts, but that, that was the most that we could handle. So, so Linda, take it back a step. You were hired by Dr. Wynn, or you were hired by Wayne McKinney. This, by, by Wayne McKinney. What year were you hired? 1971. And that is when you then took over. Well, from he wanted Dr. Wynn, or he wanted me to be the volleyball coach, and I said, that's probably not a good idea because I played with many of the players that were still on the team. And so I asked Dr. Wynn if she would please stay on and be the head coach while I tried to make this transition. And so she was the head coach and I was her assistant. And then when did you become year. head coach? 1972. The year after that? Yeah, the year after that. So we had three volleyball teams and uh, it was a lot of fun. I mean, our third team would play College of the Ozarks, mm -hmm. Cotty College, a lot of NAIA schools. Mm -hmm. and Southern then, Baptist Evangel. Uh -huh. But I'm still confused. If you were hired as the coach, but you weren't really... I was hired to teach physical education. Exactly. So Correct. you were really hired as a teacher. I, Correct. Yeah, I taught Professor. a full load of classes. A full load. Uh, back then was three courses? Eight, or? eight, <laughs> eight a semester. Eight and nine three. classes eight? a semester. <laughs> eight and nine classes. And volunteerly. Fifteen hours is what coach. I call really? And our practice times were uh, in the east court of McDonald Arena. Mm -hmm. um, there was a there were classes. Then there was dance class or dance practice. Then there was wrestling practice. And then we got in the gym about six o'clock at night, mm -hmm. and we'd have practice from six to eight with the varsity and junior varsity. And then the B team would go from eight to nine thirty mm -hmm. at night. Then what, what year did you actually start getting a payment as a volleyball coach? <laughs> and under what kind of... Or did it first start off as a, a reduced load, teaching load? Is that how it got started? <laughs> it all kind of meshed together. <laughs> <laughs> Take him through the progressions without the years then. At some point, maybe your load decreased? Yeah, then, then I was reduced to maybe six classes and then half time, four classes. And this is still a departmental matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's just a department deciding how to do mm -hmm. this. Was McKinney the one that then allowed you to do that? Was he still there saying, Linda, we'll now pay you if you only have 60% load? That part's a little fuzzy. <coughs> I just know I was getting a paycheck. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> you know, maybe this yeah. is a dumb question, but there's always pushback. But was there any pushback from instructors who thought that coaching wasn't best use of scarce departmental resources? I don't know. And so then Linda, kind of keep taking us here, that uh, what happened after a reduced load? What was the next progression of getting eventually to full time? Uh, well, we were, at, we were in McDonald Arena until Hampton Student Center was built. <clears throat> and that first year was 1976. And Reba and I moved over there. We were in the basement of the Hammond Student Center. Got Reba, flooded. Reba in basketball. Uh -huh. Linda in basketball. Right. And um, I was still teaching a lot of the volleyball classes and coaching volleyball classes. Uh, boy, probably till 80 something, 80, 82-ish. Or something like that. And that's when you went full time. And then I was appointed assistant athletic director uh, with Dr. Wynn. Appointed yes. by Dr. Wynn? Uh -huh. So when did that happen, roughly? It was like 80, 82. So at some point the university decided they were going to have kind a of women's when athletic. NCAA started recognizing yeah. Dr. Wynn was 
named the Senior Women's Administrator. Did they start doing that? Her timeline says 70. Uh, what's your timeline say? Because I saw the 75. She was athletic director First for women. First full-time director of women's yeah. athletics. That was, now, we did the timeline. I guess it's correct. I think that's correct, <laughs> yeah. Because it's in the 76 yearbook, so that's okay. 75, 76. She was, uh, and, and that's the story you told about. And it had been Wayne well. before then, and then Mary Jude took over the athletic part. What did you yeah. say the first part? Wayne McKinney was in mm -hmm. charge of it before, and that's when Mary Jo took over the athletic, women's athletic women's department. Women's athletics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. and men, uh, men and women's athletic department merged in 1992, according to this timeline. So Dr. Wynn was the head of women's athletics separate from men's athletics until 92 when then the director of athletics was over all athletics. all athletics. But it was a university endeavor at that point, not a departmental endeavor. And what was the university, you know, was the university uh, It wasn't promoting? departmental in 82. You, it went to an women's athletic department. In who, who was your boss then? The president? The president. Mm -hmm. So you reported directly to the you reported directly to the president. To Dr. Marshall Gordon. Okay. But it and wasn't what? under uh, PE anymore. Right. So two kind of related questions that I want to get at eventually. Uh, one is um, attendance at these events. And also just like media relations. And <laughs> you know, how did the how did the university were they pleased and proud and beating the drum that women's <laughs> athletics was, or was it just a quiet revolution? It was, I, I, we have to do this. <laughs> kind of begrudgingly, we got to do this. Yeah. Kind of. Well, when um, I was in charge of our Hall of Fame, when we were inducting women into our Women's Athletics Hall of Fame. We had fame. separate from the men. And so I would always put together um, photos and things like that. So that made me realize that in the yearbook, there were absolutely no photographs that recorded the women's sports teams, mm -hmm. other than perhaps a team picture mm -hmm. that people would gather, mm -hmm. have a still photo taken of the team, and then that was it. And then you'd, you'd have the, the sports section for example, men's basketball yeah, have, have all these pictures of montage them shooting of, yeah, and yeah. all this, and then there'd be a little picture here of the women's team. Yeah. That was it. And that, that is very typical. That's early, first half, first half of the 70s. Right? Yeah. Well, one thing I have always regretted is that I didn't keep statistics mm. on the women's program in the sports information department at that time had no interest, so they didn't keep anything. So we lost a lot of history. But, you know, I was more interested at the time in getting the programs in the forefront than yeah. I was providing the opportunities to play. Yeah, yeah. keeping the statistics. Yeah, yeah. keeping statistics. Yeah. So Linda and Reba, kind of going back to what Dean Tom asked, like in, when you moved over to Hammond Student Center in around, you say, 76. 76, and she had just become athletic director over women's athletics. What support staff did you have? No. I mean, entirely. Did you have assistant coaches? Did you have mm -hmm. sports information, which I think we related to, but did you have any kind of support staff? Yeah, I think it was right around 80, 81 that I got an assistant coach. But that was it. You know, no trainer, no academic no person, no shared a trainer somewhere. No, but way no one traveled. Coach. Nobody traveled. Nobody traveled. Yeah. Nobody traveled? No, no, I mean assistant. Oh. Like no how trainers. Would you, how would you travel during this stage of it? Drive the cars. We yeah. took um, you would get a van. <laughs> she got vans, I think. I, <laughs> university. Uh, uh, the university. University pool. pool. Yeah, yeah. You and drove I, it yourself? I yeah. drove every mile yeah. Yeah. for a long time. And um, when we went to the first uh, yeah, volleyball AIW right. National yeah. in Long Beach, California, oh. Reba and I drove the whole way. The whole what, way. What year? Uh, Reba was coaching. I was a student then. 
I, you drove all the I way wasn't all coaching day. volleyball. <laughs> she just volunteered. I had to leave my softball team. We got started when I got back, I think. What year? Uh, it was 70. It was 70. Early 70. Yeah. Yeah. Because I didn't come until 69. It was that okay. first year. But we drove out there. And I was just along for the ride. We had kids laying in the floor of the car, um, you know, wherever they could. We stopped in Las Vegas. So, Reba, you were just doing it because they needed another driver. Well, she was going to defend her dissertation at Oregon, and I had to bring them back. And it had to be so again, you a, a faculty. I was just there. And uh, we stopped in Las Vegas, and of course we went and checked in. We had to get the money straightened out somehow that we had from school, so I could have the money when we got there, and then she had to leave. And um, so we finally got that done, and we headed down to the strip in Las Vegas. All the kids were coming back; they didn't know what to do. <laughs> and I said, "Well, I don't know what to do. Ask her." Maybe we know this on camera. I know. That's right. <laughs> so, how did the team do in the first national tournament? Oh, I thought you meant in Las Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was eighth. 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 Well, first of all, there there were never there. Were, this was the first national championship, yeah. oh. so nobody knew anything knew about what to anybody. Expect. Yeah. How many teams were there? There were 28 teams. 28. Wow. There were four. Pool. Pool play first. Four pools of seven teams. And does that come out to 28? Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. that's good. <laughs> <laughs> and so we played each other in our pool. And I remember us playing Long Beach, the host school. And we took a set off of them. And we heard people going, What's the name of that team? <laughs> but, yeah, they want to know who we were. And so we got out of the pool play and we got seated something like fifth or sixth. Yeah, pretty good seat. And we lost our first round and we ended up a little old Haywood, California that we should have lost. <laughs> right. <it. laughs> we ended up, I think, seventh or eighth place yeah. in the first national championship. But again, that's before scholarship, <clears throat> so it really right. didn't matter the size of institution you were playing at. Yeah. Right. Because yeah, all they, in the same boat. Yeah, yeah. yeah everybody, everybody was, was even. Was yeah. yeah, there were junior colleges there too. Yeah. So we were one of <clears throat> about three teams that were west. It was us, uh, Southern, Southern Illinois, Illinois, Miami, uh, Day Junior College, and maybe one other school. You mean more east? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, or further east. east. Because most of yeah. them were from the West Coast area. Yeah, right. right. And then we uh, dropped Dr. Wynn off, and <laughs> we only had seven players, so not many substitutions. <laughs> and so the seven players and Reba, we drove back in the station wagon. A long drive. That's a long drive. But we got out of school. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> but you'd get back and you'd be expected to be in class. Even oh, if you yeah. would get home at three or four in the morning. Oh, not, yeah. Not behind. And yeah. they would have to be teaching class. Yeah. By what? Eight? You'd have to be at your eight o'clock class. Yes, yeah, so if you and had I've, one, I've you never driven all the way to LA, but I've looked into it, and it's like about a three. If you drive eight hours, it's a three-day drive. I have it in an RV. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you can stop it. It's a drive. Yeah, it's quite a trip. Yeah. <laughs> it's a drive. It's about a, a 24 hour trip. So, what did you think of the, as a player? I mean, what was your what was your sense of you? So, you played in the first national championship right. for it was women's great. volleyball. Mm -hmm. It was it was just remarkable experience. I mean, we we stayed in the dormitory there, and they had a, a student from Long Beach that was assigned to each team as kind of a student host. And Reba, you remember her, Ellie mm -hmm. was her name, and she remained you a friend of ours. Her name? Mm -hmm. Yeah, she came out here. She came out here and visited. She took us to Disney World, I have, no, Disneyland. Yeah. Disneyland. Oh, Disneyland. Oh, Disneyland. Disneyland. Yeah. So she remained as a friend for a while, oh. but you know, it was, it was just so different. I mean, I don't, I don't even know where you stayed, Mary Jo, if you were in the residence hall or you were in a hotel. I don't even know. Where were we? we were in a hotel, I think. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Who was the impetus? Who was the person nationally that 
was pushing for that volleyball national tournament. Do you know? Was it somebody Shafts, at Long Beach? Fran Shaftsma or something was the coach at Long Beach. She was the coach at Long Beach, but it was the AIAW National Committee. Oh, it was. That's, okay. That set up, you know, championships. Oh, okay. So sports. AIAW set up that national tournament. And yes. the first one was in April yeah. of 70, and the next year it was in February, and then years after that it was in the fall. Okay. So at that point, you didn't even have a sense of when the season occurred? Or? Mm -mm. <laughs> yeah. Well, we started in October, and shoot, we'd play volleyball tournaments and basketball tournaments on all the same weekend. Yeah. Um, yeah, and yeah, you'd I play mean, all through the spring. Sue Schubel and I were on both teams. Everyone. We played, we had a, a tournament in McDonald Arena, and we played all morning, and then we had about a two-match break. So we ran over to Greenwood. Reba was basketball. coaching basketball, and we changed our shoes and <laughs> That's probably when we played different over there. <laughs> <laughs> Finished the second half of the basketball game, and then we went back over to the volleyball <laughs> tournament. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm guessing back then you had a lot of multi-sport athletes. Yeah, we, we didn't have any specific weight training, yeah. conditioning. Mm -hmm. We didn't do. It was mostly. Play. We didn't have a study hall. <laughs> we didn't have anything extra. But yes, yeah. well, and, and if you're picking up from the early days, make sure this is correct in volleyball because this is how it was in basketball. In the early days when the universities were simply out of the academic side, the highest caliber athletes were at the Olympic level or the an amateur athletic union level. And then colleges were just starting to participate. So is that the correct way to say that when you're talking about um, your professional athletes when you were first starting to play as a university? Did volleyball have AAU out there where the best athletes were playing in AAU? Like well, in an amateur international league? Yeah, I mean, there was club yeah. where they could play, but there were, you know, there were like, where were people playing if it wasn't in the colleges? Remember, there was not much communication. So you really didn't know what other people were doing. You had to search to find and, and you know, I did my uh, master's, in, or like the paper for Dr. McKinney on volleyball. It was a volleyball skill, and there, you look up the bibliography stuff, you know, there, was, there were no books. Yeah. <laughs> it made volleyball pretty simple to research because there wasn't there, anything there. There wasn't much there. <laughs> yeah, there really wasn't. It was all up in here, people who knew the game. It was hard to find out what was going on. But how would you how would you feel an Olympic team back then? You know, or just out of the club sports, I suppose? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They had, uh, it's called USVBA, United States Volleyball Association, which is now USA Volleyball. Uh -huh. And they'd have national championships and they would select people from there. Uh-huh. Yeah. We didn't have any All-Americans because there weren't any selections made. Yeah. <laughs> and I really had most high schools hadn't take, taken up the sport yet, so. No, they were playing volleyball in high school. Mm -hmm. but, but we didn't have state tournaments until '75, I don't think. Yeah, something like in that. In high school. Yeah. Uh, scholarships. When did how? When and how did scholarships come in? Well, the AIW really prided themselves on being an academic uh, program. Uh -huh. That academics was more important for their student athletes than scholarships, and they wanted to let everyone have the same opportunity. Uh, there was, as I recall, uh, I believe it was tennis players from south, down south, that filed a lawsuit, uh, female tennis players, because they didn't get scholarships and the men did. <clears throat> as a result of that, the AIW was uh, informed that it would be better if they started giving scholarships. Mm. Was it formed? by lawyers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they wouldn't get taken to court. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and um, 
So that was the impetus that started the scholarships. And then it was up to each institution as to what they could do. And that's where you start to see schools that became powerhouses and schools that... Well, a lot of schools dumped whatever money they were going to use. They kind of dumped it into one or two sports. Missouri State SMS was not one of those schools. They wanted to have everything kind of equal across the board. And so what money they were going to put into the scholarships, it was going to be pieced out to every sport for about the same amount. Was that a Dr. Wynn decision? It was. It was. <laughs> when you said they, I just thought. It wasn't me. <laughs> I wanted more. <laughs> and, and, and going back to that lawsuit, Dr. Wynn, were uh -huh. you and maybe Reba, were you all going to AIAW meetings mm -hmm. at this point? Uh, um, and, and the point I'm trying to make is Dr. Wynn, Reba, I don't know who else, was well, actually to start with. in on the governance at a national level that, uh, I don't know the right way to say it, you were part of the administrative impetus of these decisions. Is yes. that a correct she way was, to say yes. that? Can she you was on the board. That? She was on the board. Well, speak sure. to that if you can. Go, go back historically. <laughs> well, I probably would have to have some prompting. Uh, Remember all well, we went to the first one. I remember doing that. The first yeah. what exactly? AIW meeting, national meeting. Yeah. And did uh, you organize the national meeting? No, Christine Grant. Mm -hmm. Right. What was the lady from California? Uh, from UCLA, uh, Chris. Uh, anyway, uh, Judy Holland. Judy. Uh -huh. That's it. Where was it held? Gosh, I can't Two. remember. Can you? The first AIEW. It might have been in Kansas City. I thought I heard you all say Kansas City. I think City. it was it Kansas City. Because I remember going up there, we went up there a couple of times after I got out of practice at 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock at night. We drove up there and they would have a meeting after the women's professional national group that were already gathered there. Administrators? No, no, they were professional women teachers that had their national meeting there. What's that called? Uh, Nancy went to that all the time. <coughs> anyway, uh, they had that, and then they would were having a, a break off of that about 10, 30 at night to talk about women athletics and what was going to happen. And, and where was this were the we going? forming of AIAW or just no. what decisions were needed to be made? <clears throat> right. Yeah. And how, how long had AIAW been in existence at that point? Well, they, and that, I mean, started in 72. AIAW? Yes. Okay. Right. But I uh, can't tell you exactly yeah. when that was. Yeah. But and it lasted only about 10 years to about 18? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It did. And then we joined Division I. And uh, no. AIW was all together. All the schools were together. There's no first. division one or two in AIW. And then, <coughs> and then it was divided into small and large, if I recall correctly. Yes, and then it was divided into division one and two. And that's when I went to the board, uh, the governing board at the university. SNS board. Mm -hmm and asked that our women's program uh, be permitted to play in Division I of AIAW. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the board members said, well, doesn't that make our men second-class citizens? Because they were Division II. <laughs> they were Division II at the time, in NCAA. What board member? I can tell you, but I <laughs> <laughs> not all that's in all the history. <laughs> It says 1982, Missouri uh, State University moved to Division One. 1982. So keep going. So what was the decision? Did yeah, men then become Division One, Division One too? The the decision, and Dwayne Meyer was president. Uh, the decision was that uh, our volleyball team and uh, our softball team, because they had done so well, mm -hmm. 
could go Division One, but everyone else had to stay Division no. Two. But they also appointed a committee to study about the men going to Division One. Oh. <laughs> so Dr. Wynn may have been the impetus for the men to go to Division One. Yeah, so, she was. <laughs> And so they went to Division One, and of course that's when Maryland was saying, as an institution, everyone went to Division One. Now, uh, you were instrumental in starting the Gateway Conference. Uh -huh. Was that about the same time? That was uh, 1982. Yeah. Uh -huh. So what was 1982, the instrumental in starting, this is Mary Jo Wynn. Instrumental in starting the Gateway Conference. Yep, yeah, that's what I got down here too. Which was only the women's competing. Yes. Oh, it was a women's well, only conference. Yes, started out that way. We were never in a conference. They yeah. started a conference. Yeah. So well, who all was in the Gateway Conference? Just who were some of the schools in the Gateway Conference? Well, there was uh, most of the Missouri Valley schools. Yeah. Illinois well, State. Except for two. Yeah. Um, Western most Illinois and Eastern Missouri. Illinois. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but, <clears throat> you know, we, before the AIW was formed, uh, the women leaders requested the NCAA to accept women's sports, and they voted us down. Resoundingly? Yes. Really? And then... Uh, In fact, we say they didn't want us. What were the issues when they thought it was? Who knows? She went in on that decision. What was it about? <laughs> Probably. Probably. Sharing. I think I thought on camera. What was it about? <laughs> <laughs> so, it usually is. anyway, as a result, the women decided that we needed some avenue for women to be able to compete yeah. and to compete at the national level. And that was the reason the AIW was formed. Mm -hmm. Now, after it was formed, and uh, started getting TV revenue, the men voted to include women. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> and there was still controversy. Some AIAW yes. went, some did not. That's true. It was very controversial. Did some join conferences and some remained independent? I doubt there were many conferences then. Well, I mean, we had no choice. The administration said we were going in CWA. Yeah. And so, well, the first volleyball nationals, um, NCAA, the AIAW had national championships in 1981, mm -hmm. which we competed in. But there were many teams that went to the NCAA championships, mm -hmm. and then in 1982 we made that full transition to NCAA and went to the NCAA national championships. You mean 92? No, 82. 82. 82. From A A W to N C A A. Yeah, I bet that was for volleyball. Right. So you mentioned television revenue. Can we talk state. a little bit about just media coverage? Newspapers, radio, television. That won't take very long. Well, I know you've got a great story about Jane Meyer. Oh yeah, Mary Jane. That's a Dr. Wynn story again. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you add to it. Uh, from my understanding, of course, Dr. Wynn and, and Jane Meyer were coordinating this deal. Uh, I believe Mary Jo wrote letters to how many radio stations? All of them. How many was that? All the ones in the Springfield area or just Springfield? Just, just Springfield. To cover uh, women's, basketball. women's basketball. What mm -hmm. year would that have been around? When Valerie was coaching. 80. 85? Fast or break was club. It us? Fast break club was started in 1987, so it had to be before that. Yeah. So this was before I think you were on, we were on radio when I was an assistant, so that would have been well, 83 through 87. Well, first of all, they also had a TV station. And the Myers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 27. So were you trying to get on TV as well? They put us on TV and the radio, and then they got rid of the station, and then we didn't have any more TV. So, her and Jane Meyer were, came to an agreement, I assume, signed a contract. For the radio, uh, 
in the letter we wrote, we told them, you know, they could sell the the uh, sponsorship advertisement, advertisement, or yeah. we would. Oh. And so it turned out that we started and was selling it for them. And you were selling advertising yeah. for your games. Successfully. <laughs> wow. And then because it was successful, then they took it over. <laughs> Which suited me fine because, you yeah. know, that's hard. That's, that's a lot of work. Getting yeah. out and yeah. a lot of work. Yeah. So one of the first games was going to be on, t on uh, radio. And Jane, it might have been a Sunday night or just whatever night it was. And no, Jane, first of all, you have to realize that Ken, her husband, is a diehard bear fan, men bear fan. Yeah. No interest in the women at that point, or yeah. much. Yeah. And so Jane and Dr. Wynn had this agreement to be on radio, and <laughs> Jane one night at home said to Ken, well, <laughs> let's turn on our station. And he's going, why do I need to turn on, uh, just turn on our station. She knew. That. And the Lady Bears, or, or women's basketball, was on his and her station, which he did not know about. <laughs> what was his reaction? <laughs> I guess uh, favorable. Because <laughs> you got to stay. <laughs> you got to stay. <laughs> and you, you know, how did you, uh, how did you, how did you build up? Uh, it, was it difficult or easy to build up in-person attendance? Because I know you did. I saw somewhere that the first year you were here, your average attendance was eight hundred and seven. By the last year, it was close to 13,000. I don't think it was 807. <laughs> it was more like 400, right? Well, depends on what you're talking about. Yeah, it would have been 87. Yeah, but it they, was small. She started the whole process when Valerie Goodwin was head coach. Is when the Fast Break Club started. Uh, Valerie was very involved. They were having 7 a.m. meetings. Um, you know, Dr. Wynn, you need to speak to that because I wasn't there. Well, I uh, again wrote a letter to all the professional women in Springfield. By that I mean lawyers and doctors and, and uh, business owners. Business owners, asking them to join me for breakfast to uh, promote the women's athletic program, kind of like women helping women. I emphasize that because none of them had any athletic background. And so the, uh, not because necessarily that they didn't, but they're coming through at times when there weren't that many opportunities for right. them if they're getting right. this big professional background. So I had uh, probably 35 or 40 attend the first breakfast meeting and I, I paid for it, uh, you know, and uh, then we had uh, a gentleman from our marketing department speak to them. Robin and, Luke? Uh -huh, and told him, you know, what we were trying to do. And uh, he was very good. Well, out of that group, we had probably 20 that took the challenge on it. And um, that's kind of what started everything. And they did everything from promotions to whatever, mm -hmm. but uh, that's what started when we started to build the fan base. Uh -huh. And it started out that first of all, they wanted to try to do it for all sports. Well, I knew that wouldn't work because that's spread too thin. All women's sports? Or? Yeah. And so we decided to take what we thought would be the most easiest sport to get the fan base which was basketball, mm -hmm. and uh, then that if we were successful in basketball, it would spread over to the other sports. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was what we were thinking. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we did everything under the sun to promote it. Mm -hmm. So what was the fast break, fast break club, and how did that get started? That was the that was it. That's it. That's the, That's that the was women the... that attended the breakfast. Okay. And you'd always meet for breakfast? Uh, no, actually at one point we decided that uh, to meet at the locations of these women because if they went into a company 
uh, let's say an insurance company or whatever, and saw all these women coming in, people would wonder, what's going on? Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. And so we would need Syntex, uh, yeah. insurance companies, uh, yeah. realtors, yeah. yeah, a vast difference of yeah. backgrounds. And, and not to miss one of the keys to this is Dr. Wynn was the athletic director over women's athletics. So any idea that they came up with, she fulfilled through the athletic department. So I was my own boss. So I could do yeah, she was her own boss. So she didn't have to okay anything. She, if there was a good idea, yeah. she made sure it was fulfilled. And you answered the, the president directly to the president, so it was a pretty. Mm -hmm. Yes. And he was. Yeah. Wouldn't you say he was, he was very, very supportive? supportive. Yeah. Very. In fact, supportive. his wife uh, came to me, and she came to me, and, and Gordon, mm -hmm. and suggested that. Uh, why didn't I have this, these women uh, come over to her house before a game for a brunch? And she'd have the president speak to them. And I said, you can do that? And she said, sure, he won't get breakfast. <laughs> that shows their kind of support, you know. And so she said, and invite others, you know. So we did that. And that kind of, and, and then she suggested, which I thought was really sharp, smart, that uh, I hired the trolley. They had a trolley at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, had them park at Hammond Student Center, where the game would be, and transport them by trolley to her house, and then transport them back to Hammond Student Center. And that way you wouldn't lose them in the transition. Yeah. And they've already got the car parked and at a close park. spot to the yeah. arena. Yeah. 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 Uh, did you? Did I read somewhere that you also were the first woman to join the Springfield Rotary Club? Mm, I think I think Nancy Brown at the time and I joined the same time. I don't think I was the first, but was that a big deal? At the time, you know, we were trying to promote everything. It certainly didn't hurt on it. And uh, we'd have, uh, you know, coach speak, bring some players and speak, hand out tickets. We gave away a lot of free tickets to start with. Uh, so I think it was a good thing. Mm -hmm. They went, went to the elementary schools. And the, the kids players, did. And they yeah. gave out tickets. Of course, the parents came and yeah. paid for tickets. Yeah. They packed the house that way. Mm -hmm. Well, at that time, uh, the concession stands belonged to athletics. Oh. And they used to say, you know, Mary Jo, you're giving away all these free tickets, where are you going to start making money? <laughs> well, when they, you know, if you get kids there, you know where they got to have go. popcorn and <laughs> Coke. Yeah. Well, you had a lot of fathers say, well, I got free tickets, and then I had to spend $30 at the concession <laughs> Yes, yeah, because their daughter or son had brought <clears throat> friends out. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Talk so, a little bit about the, the gold card. Just, oh, well, as a part of our promotion, <clears throat> we decided to sell gold cards in uh, $20 a piece to start with. And that would give them admission to the volleyball and basketball both mm -hmm. on it, all the games. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we, we kind of stole that idea from the uh, University of Iowa. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was probably two years after that, uh, Chris called me and she said they had had the go-kart, the actual go-kart people, uh, call them tell them they couldn't do that anymore no. because of the name. And or you couldn't call it a gold card. Yeah. Mm. And so that kind of, mm. so then we put G-O-A-L. Gold mm. card. And uh, <laughs> that, was 30, that was $35 and that was a season ticket. That's right. And yeah. uh, you got popcorn and a soda mm. at halftime free with that ticket. You went to a certain place. You got your gold card. 
<laughs> so that was Mary Jo's idea too. And back to the AIAW just for a moment. So the, how does that, once it got going, there were state championships and then regional championships and then a national championship, is that how it worked? Yes. We had the MAIAW and in the Region 6, we were in Region 6, six. and in the Nationals. Okay. And Region 6 was uh, six states, is that right? Kansas, Missouri, Iowa, North and South Dakota, Minnesota. Yeah. yeah. Six. Uh, new topic we haven't talked about yet. So, uh, you know, diversity is a diverse topic. Um, but uh, I think now at MSU, I want to say about 12% of the student body is uh, self-identifies as African American. Uh, I'm guessing it wasn't that high back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Mm -hmm. no. um, what about diversifying women's athletics at MSU? Are there any were there any challenges there? Were there any? Only one time I had, uh, and we did have, you know, some, uh, I don't know, black African American athletes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but President Meyer was trying to get more diversity in the university, and he came to me and wanted me to recruit more blacks. And uh, he wanted you to. Mm -hmm. He wanted me to. Mm -hmm. And my comment was that, you know, where do you find black athletes? We just didn't want to recruit a black that couldn't participate in the sport. And uh, he told me, heart building, sir. I said, well, President, that's my hometown. <laughs> <laughs> I know they're not there. <laughs> they're, they're in the country, yes. But, uh, you know, but the athlete, black athletes, no. That's the only time anyone has ever said anything to me about trying to diversify. It just happened. Mm -hmm. We have we've had uh, foreign track athletes, mm -hmm. foreign tennis players. Tracy Tarkington's aunt is one. Um, we've talked about this, but uh, Sandra Whitman, oh, a volleyball player. Or what did she volleyball. play? Volleyball. Mm -hmm. And what around what year? It was in the early seventies. Played volleyball. Played and Eleanor Jones. And Eleanor mm -hmm. Jones. Mm -hmm. Eleanor Jay. Jones also played softball. About mm -hmm. the same time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think then in our discussions the next. African-American might have been Elaine Mullins on women's basketball, but again, we we didn't have a track person in the room. Um, I had when, a couple of black who, who uh, African-American. What years? God, don't ask me names. <laughs> basketball? <laughs> yeah, basketball. Mm -hmm. Names and years. Yeah. I'd have to look back in the scorebooks. So that would score be before books. Elaine Mullins. Yeah. Well, I think you also have to look at the um, institution's enrollment. It was very small. Yeah. Yeah. So overall, I overall. Think it was. well, yeah, and the percentage, yeah. The percentage of African of Americans yeah. back in the '70s was probably about two percent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I know a Cecilia Wingfield's father, Duke Wingfield, was supposedly one of the first on the male side. Mm -hmm. um, what year was that? You know, I don't know. Duke would probably be <coughs> seven. Late 70s, right now. Um, they, they had some. Bill Thomas had some in the early 70s, because yeah. I remember. Because he was a track playing. guy, and I've heard that. I don't know that to be yeah. a fact. Well, in 1962, when Marilyn and I graduated, there was one black man, Carl Wilkes. He was mm -hmm. the only one in our class. In the graduating class. Was he an athlete or just oh, a yeah. Athlete, so. yeah, a great athlete. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 yeah, great guy, but he was the only one. Yeah. Do you all have reunions where student athletes come back? Come back. We've tried a few. Okay. <laughs> so the the last um, what is it called? The uh, outstanding alumni, the yeah. Bears of Distinction Bears Awards, of Distinction, yeah. which was on June twenty fourth. Uh, one of my volleyball athletes received 
the pair of, of distinction, uh -huh. Cecile Renaud, and she graduated in 75. And so I tried to get some of her teammates there, which I got about 10, yeah, you got yeah. a good show. 10 athletes, and they were all 60 and older. It's kind of scary. <laughs> but some of them hadn't been back in a long, long time, so we had a tour yeah. of McDonald Arena, because yeah. that's the only place they played. Mm -hmm. And then we took them over to Hammond Student Center to show them the... When they make a campus, do they... Uh, yeah, well, most of them had at least been by or had seen it, so, yeah. yeah. But, um, they had a great time, though. Yeah, they did. Yeah. They did. Yeah. So, yeah, we do have some reunions. We're about out of time for this session. I know some of us have two o'clock meetings and, and have to go. We're, we can always do it again, as long as we do it on a Thursday. Friday. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. Dean Tom, Dr. Wynn has this, and Marilyn has uh, also a document. I think you'll want both of these. Okay. And uh, I would like. I would like both one both too. Do you That's have copies have. or? This is what I would you can make talk to you about. And get them yeah. back to you. Is that the information? You'll be right my name we on did our project? Yes, yeah, or maybe I, uh, put your it, that put your crash and I didn't I think have I have it on my computer. Yeah. Would you send me what you have? I would like to remember this is send me your reminder. Yeah, I will. Because okay. I, I just died when I couldn't find her. Well, I just want to say something about a reunion real quick that kind of goes with what we were talking about. We tried to get basketball players back when we were uh, trying to unite them and what was that about four years ago that we had them all down on the um, or was, was it, it all all players all, it was all letter okay all letter, all letter. All that's letter what it was people that did not get a letter did not anything. get a letter and we gave them letters yeah. which uh, I thought that was a great drawing in but I would like to see that repeated because if we don't do something to try to get them back on campus, they don't normally just show up. So, but that was, that was a good reunion of a lot of the athletes. And it's because they, we never got, gave out any letters. Yeah. Well, again, I want to thank all of you. I got one final question for this session, and then we can continue the conversation on another day. But um, I think this good, I will just state this, and you can rebut it if you want to. <laughs> I think across all sports, men's, women's, um, today's athletes sometimes don't really understand and appreciate the early days of the sport. No, at any level, no. whether it's a professional, they just can't comprehend. It wasn't always big contracts. It always wasn't full ride scholarships. It always wasn't, you know, sneaker right. deals and you know all that stuff that's around today. Uh, going pro early, you know, all the, they're under a lot of pressure. It's a much more complex world, I guess, in many ways. What would you say if we, if you could just have a message with all of today's athletes? What would you tell them to think about the early days? If it was just like, is you know, just remember and appreciate, or it wasn't always like this. Somebody had to lead the way. Well, I think that's exactly it. <laughs> if they, if they would learn just a little bit about what came before them, to appreciate what they have today, because yeah. there was a lot of a lot hard of struggles, work, yeah, a lot of um, you know problems, a lot of doors that had to be open. You know, a lot of uh, you know inventing your airplane as you're falling down to the earth. You know, it's like build build yeah. the thing as you go. I guess I would say that they don't lose their love for the game. Yeah. Because oftentimes, because they're so tied up in this other stuff you just named, yeah. that they forget to enjoy playing I the see game. that even at the youngest ages. You know, your, the parents are, they all have, you know. Yeah. The first thing is, build upon that love of the game. The skills can come later, and all the coaching, you know, it's like, the, the core for me is the love of the game. Whatever that game is. It's become the love of money, though. Yeah. That's true. Well, mm -hmm. the scholarship and the attention, and well, mm -hmm. they keep increasing the scholarship. Like now they can get full ride scholarship plus attendance money. Well, I think that this right here 
to me is such an integral part because if the story is told, if the story and the history is respected and told by whomever needs to tell it to those members of whatever team it is you're discussing, if the pioneers are brought back and they are respected and the story continues to be told of what it used to be like, I think that the current student athletes would go, wow, I think they would we too. appreciate much more now hearing what Marilyn went through and what Reba went through and what Linda went through. And I don't think the story is always told as well as it should be, nor the former athletes and administrators and pioneers. I mean, are respected certainly, but you know, it just has to be, is perpetuated the right word? Uh, perpetuated through history. Yeah. Well, I think one of the problems is the team's got to win. And they don't want to take time to go visit with us because that's time off of they can spend working on this skill or they can this formation or whatever it is. And they just think, oh, I don't have time to do that. I think if they realize, especially the women athletes of today, that we used to not even have the opportunity. I know, I know. We did not even have the opportunity to play. And they go, wow. Then I think of my first year of actual coaching where I got paid, I think it was $300 for <laughs> basketball and volleyball <laughs> combined, I, and having 105 students try out for volleyball, <laughs> which was overwhelming to me as a one-person coach. <clears throat> but then when the athletic director gave us our uniform uh, for the girls, it, we used it for volleyball, basketball, and track. Those were our three sports. And they had the same uniforms. And a lot of the girls were in the same sports. So by the time they got through this <laughs> track season, it was a dingy white. It used to be blue for hill <laughs> I mean, you know, they don't they even realize that, year, you know, they things. didn't get socks and shoes and they didn't get, yeah. you know, yeah. all the perks that they have today. So, and a lot of them listen. I, I visited with some of the athletes at Missouri State and they said, wow. Yeah. <laughs> but knowing the history of the sport and how it developed is part of the love of the game. Right? And that's true. Sure, yes. that is true. Well, thank, thank you very, you very much. much for thank hosting us. Yeah. Yeah. We really appreciate it.